Hey, I got a special treat for you today. Got a special treat for you today. I have invited a wonderful friend of mine for many years. He and I actually worked at Victory Outreach International uh, right here in San Dimas. Uh, our offices were catty corner to one another. Uh, we had a wonderful time serving the Lord together. Uh, he was in charge of the urban training centers globally for, the, for uh, Victory Outreach International. And today, he pastors a church, Victory Outreach West Covina, just right across the highway. We've had an opportunity to serve and hang out and bless one another. And come on, give it up for Pastor Ezra Laturco, who's also a regional pastor now for Victory Outreach International. It's a wonderful blessing and a gift to have him in the house and I told him, come share your heart, brother. God's done so many amazing things in your life, and it's a blessing to have you here. Thank you, Pastor Ezra. Thank you so much. Give it up for your pastor this morning. Come on, Luminate, give it up for your pastor. You have a great, great pastor. I know. I shared an office with him. He, and I, can I just say this um, about your pastor? Um, I shared it in the first service, and it's actually something that I was looking forward to sharing with your church. I always get tempted to call him Dr. Tommy. Anybody call him Dr. Tommy? Dr. Tommy. Because why? that's how I was introduced to him, as Dr. Tommy. And uh, as he said, I, I pastor Victory Outreach right here in West Covina. We're neighbors. And... Praise the Lord. And let me tell you, God is on the move at Victory Outreach West Covina. We're experiencing revival, and we're believing for a beautiful building like this, in Jesus' name. And uh, we serve a big God. Amen? And, uh, but for several years, as uh, Pastor Tommy mentioned, I was at the corporate office for Victory Outreach, the international headquarters. And I had the great honor to uh, work with what we call the Urban Training Centers. And we have campuses all over the world. And, and, you know, me and my wife, we oversaw them. And we had staff and directors. And we were at a time as a movement, Victory Outreach as a movement, where we knew that God had great things in the future for us. And that there was things that we wanted to do and add to and prepare for. One of them was to, is to get educated and to make sure that, that the people that God was raising up in our ministry that didn't just have the fire of the Holy Spirit, but they also had a good hold of the Word of God. How many think that's a good idea right there? And so we said, we need some help, and we need to bring in some professionals. And so who did God bring into Victory Outreach International? Pastor Tommy. And what a blessing this man has been to the ministry. I, I feel I could speak on behalf of the ministry of Victory Outreach International this morning and say thank you for your contribution because some of the things that you put into place, Pastor Tommy, are giving fruit today. We just launched our Victory Outreach Bible College, and it's all over the world. It's global. Students are being raised up, and you had a tremendous uh, role in that. So thank you. You have an amazing wife, family. I was watching the YouTube service. I just got in from Mexico. I just drove in. I was told him at 2 in the morning I was unpacking. We drove in, and uh, on the way in, I was watching last week's uh, service, and uh, what a beautiful worship ministry you have, and a powerful pastor's wife. She came up here and did communion. My God, I was crying right there in the car on the way home. And it was just powerful, powerful. How many of you are glad to be a part of a spirit-filled church? Oh, if that was a good place to clap right there. How many of you are glad to be a part of a spirit-filled church? Thank God for a beautiful building. Thank God for skilled people and gifted people. Oh, but thank God for his presence and for his Holy Spirit. That's where it's at. Amen. And so I just want to thank the Lord for all that he's done in my life. I was 18 years old when God got a hold of me. I grew up not far from here in El Monte, California, or as I used to pronounce it, Monte. Come on, somebody. And uh, I grew up right here in Almani. I'm a San Gabriel Valley guy. And um, God pulled me out of the neighborhood that I was in, the mess that I was in. And he took me to a beautiful place, the Victory Outreach Men's Recovery Home, where God does miracles. Amen. 18 years old. Walked into that home with a, crook, with a white T-shirt with a crooked crease. Amen. And I walked in there. 
And I saw all these guys and I saw all these miracles and I started to realize that God is in the miracle working business. And I became one of those miracles, amen. And he did a he did a work in my life. He broke the chains of bondage. He healed my heart. He gave me big brothers in the Lord. And not only did he save me and heal me and restore me, but he gave me a place to work for his kingdom. He gave me a place to do something for the Lord. And for many years, I was a youth pastor. Then I, we, my wife and I, we oversaw the urban training centers. And now for the last four years, I've had the privilege to be a pastor, amen, in the city of West Covina. So we're neighbors. And little did we know, Dr. Tommy, when we were working there at the corporate office and overseeing international stuff right there, little did we know that one day we'd be pastoring right here next door to each other. So I love you, brother. I love your family. And it's a privilege to be here. I have my beautiful wife here with me this morning. Stand up, my love, and everybody see your pretty face. And there's also, we have a great couple from our church, Sammy and Carla. They're here with us this morning as well. I told him I need some backup, Sammy. Come on. And he came, so I thank you guys for being here. Amen. Why don't we go ahead and go before the Lord, and let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for you for your loving kindness towards us, your amazing grace that you show towards us on a daily basis. The truth is, Lord, sometimes we don't see it or recognize it or take time to appreciate it. But right now, Lord, we just want to say thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for this beautiful house of worship, for this church that you're raising up for such a time as this. We believe that you're here with us now. We sense your presence here in this place. Lord, I invite you to come and have your way. Take full control. Open every heart. Remove any and all distraction so that we can hear loud and clear from the voice behind the voice this morning. We love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Well, we, as, as uh, Pastor Tommy shared, there's a series going on, right? It's a Holy Fire series. I hope that you've been uh, jumping in and following along, and uh, I, I got the privilege to be a part of it. And uh, the only challenge with series and topics, right, and I have a topic, it's empowered by the Spirit to serve, is I start to dig deep in these areas, and I I turned in my notes to Pastor Tommy, and it was like five pages of notes. He probably got scared, and was like, um, we only do one hour, <laughs> one hour, sir. So I'm going to do my best to get through it. Are you ready to, you ready to get God's word this morning? Well, if you have your Bibles, you could turn with me to Acts 6, or if you have your notes, it should be there on your notes. We're going to read here Acts chapter 6, verse 6. The word of God reads, now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews and the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you Seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, here in Acts 6, we, we see how the early church was in a time of expansion. They were in a time where, where, where God was moving in a powerful way. Things were taking place. People were being added to the church on a daily basis. It's kind of like an atmosphere that we have here today at Luminate Church. Hello, can somebody say amen? amen? Where people are getting saved, families are being restored, and great things are taking place. It was a time of expansion. And we also remember in Acts 1-8, the Bible says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Pastor Tommy was talking a little bit about this verse last Sunday, where the Lord endued his people with power. He gave them power upon their lives. He says, this is what's going to happen when I leave the Holy Spirit. He's going to come upon you, and you're going to receive a power on your life. 
And this power isn't just so that you could be powerful. This isn't so that you could walk around and people could recognize how great you are, how powerful you are. But I'm giving you this power with purpose. And whenever God releases an anointing, whenever God releases power upon his people, it's with purpose. I like to say we don't serve a a just because God. He's not doing things just because. But he's intentional. He's strategic. And with purpose, in Acts 1.8, he told the disciples, there's going to be a power that's going to hit you. And this power is going to have purpose because I want you to serve. I want you to serve as my witnesses. That way, wherever you go, whether it be Judea or Samaria or even to the ends of the earth. I'm sure they had one of these faces when he said that. The ends of the earth. But we're just Jerusalem guys. We're just Judea guys. Some of us haven't even been to Samaria yet. And he said, I'm telling you, I'm going to give you a power that's going to open up doors for you. I'm going to give you a power that you're going to be able to do things you normally wouldn't be able to do. (laughs) Things that you probably never even imagined yourself doing. I feel there's probably people here today, you're serving and doing things right now that you've never done before. Some of you might be involved in a way you've never been involved before. And some of you, even right now, the Holy Spirit's knocking at your door and telling you it's time to get involved. Huh? It's one thing to be a church goer and another thing to be a church grower. And I believe this is a season for Luminate where God is raising up a church to do just that. He's raising up a church to illuminate in the San Gabriel Valley. To be that shining light. That's going to draw people to him, to be his witnesses. The disciples in the book of Acts chapter 6, they were moving in that Acts 1-8 power. It was a season of growth. It was a season of more. And it was a season where some from amongst them were going to be raised up. But we also read that complaints were being made. Things were being overlooked and needs were going unmet. And had things not changed, the work of God could have been hindered. Had the disciples not, you know, sought the Lord and and got a plan and and began to reach out, had they not done the right things at the right time, the work of God could have been hindered. Imagine that. I think sometimes it's missed on us that we play a role in what God wants to do. See, God is sovereign, and in his sovereignty, he decided to work through people. That's why the title of my message this morning is, We Are His Plan. He could have kept moving through a pillar of fire. He could have continued to move as a pillar of smoke. But he says, no, I want to move through my people. And there's a book that I I read as a young Christian to mark my life. It was by Robert E. Coleman, Master Plan of Evangelism. And it said, men were his method. Intentionally, on purpose, he gathered men around them that he would live with and walk with and work with and impart in and model to because he wanted to pour himself into them because his expectation was that when he would leave, he would do and do them with power to continue to do what they saw him do. That's why the Holy Spirit gave power. And sometimes I think that many times, you know, we can miss that. Many times growth and promotion comes from the challenge and problems that we face. These create opportunities. Sometimes our greatest moments of growth come from our greatest moments of testing and stretching. We see that the disciples here were in one of these seasons. Things begin to, they needed attention. Things were needed, needed to be addressed. And we see that the disciples rose to the occasion. It was the challenge that pulled the best out of them. It was the challenge of growth that pulled the best from those around them. Something, I believe, clicked within the disciples. They realized and they understood that this was about meeting the needs of others. As they begin to move in that power, as God begin to do great things, as God begin to add to the church, they realize, you know what, we need to serve God's people. There's needs that need to be met, and we have a job to do. They heard the call to serve. 
They recognized that it was about honoring God. It was about serving. It was about doing their part to carry the load. I believe that they were moving in that power from Acts 1-8, but they needed the strategy from Acts 6. And the enemy, he's always there willing to convince us that what we do doesn't matter. Sometimes he works overtime at getting us to see ourselves as less than. But the thing we need to remember this morning is that God desires to use our lives. God desires to use your life here this morning. Sometimes we look around and we wonder where will the help come from? Who will lead? Who will rise up? Who will answer the call? But I want to, I want to tell you here this morning, Illuminate Church, that God has called you to answer the call. God has called you, he's anointed you, he's appointed you for such a time as this. How many could say amen if I said that God is doing something new in this church here today? God is doing something new. And how do we know that God wants to do something new? One, one thing we could tell is that God brought some great leaders to the house. Somebody say amen. amen. But as great as they are, and they're pretty great. As great as they are, how many know they can't do it by themselves? That's why some of you are beginning to rise up. Some of you are starting to sense the call. Some of you have told yourself, but I'm retired in ministry. And God says, yeah, I'm pulling you out of retirement. Woo! My serving days are behind me. God says, no, the best days are ahead of you. And there might be some that are fearful. Maybe you've made mistakes in the past. Maybe you haven't been that great. But here's the good thing about when God anoints and God empowers. It doesn't have much to do with your skill set, your experience, your strength, how good you are. We don't have to rely on how good we are. We rely on God's power within us. God has empowered us. God has not only called us, but he's empowered us to step into the ministry that he's called us to. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, for we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I want to bring your attention to that word workmanship. Some translations say handiwork or craftsmanship. Some translations even say masterpiece, that we're his masterpiece. God saves us not merely to save us from the wrath we rightly deserve, but also to make something beautiful of us. We are his workmanship, which translates the Greek word. I'm going to destroy the Greek right here, so bear with me. Poemia. And the idea is that we are his beautiful poem. We are his masterpiece. The Jerusalem Bible translates workmanship as work of art. In other words, we have God's fingerprints all over our lives. And you may sometimes feel less than. You may sometimes not feel capable. Maybe sometimes we see other people doing real good. And you say, oh, man, they're good at it. Oh, well, that's because they're different. And I'm not like them. I'm telling you, you got God's fingerprints all over your life. I'm telling you, Ephesians says you're his masterpiece. Just the way this pulpit, we stand here and we see this pulpit, we know that somebody made this pulpit. Somebody put, had a, a, a vision in their, in their minds when they put it together. It was intentional. It didn't just happen. I want to tell you this morning, that you, God made you with purpose. We're his workmanship. That means that we're a result of or a product of God's handiwork. That means we are his craftsmanship. Psalms 139, verse 14 says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Doesn't it feel good to know that God had a hand in making you? Come on, somebody. You're an original. I said, you're an original. I just got back from Ensenada. I was over there all week. And once something happened to me over there, the first time, I've been going back and forth to Mexico for many years. One of our UTC campuses was in Rosarito, and I'd be traveling all those, doing trainings and teachings and, you know, speaking to the young people. And something happened my very first time in Mexico. I got shook down by the federales. They got my taco money. Amen. Hallelujah. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I looked at them like, boy, you're trying to shake down the man of God. 
<laughs> and he did. I told him, I'm a pastor. I just want you to know I'm a pastor. You take from me, you take it from God. And he was like, amen, make it cash. And I was like, yeah. so pray for that, brother. <laughs> but something else happened when I was in Ensenada. You know, Ensenada is a tourist town. So they had a whole strip full of bootlegs. Come on, somebody, right? Prada. And people were buying glasses thinking they were getting Pradas and Gucci's. I was like, those aren't Gucci's. Those are Fuchis, amen, come on. You got the, you got the wrong one, baby. That, that's a bootleg, man. That's not the real deal. You got the fake stuff. But how many know in the house of God, you're the real deal here this morning? Uh, somebody needs to shake it off. Come on, shake off that lie. I say you are the real deal. We're his plan. Fault in everything. So when you look in the mirror, when you think about what you could do for God, don't look at your past. Don't look at your weaknesses. Look at your God. Because we are not bootlegs in the house of the Lord. Come on, tell the person next to you, check the tag, baby. It's real. We're not made in Mexico. We're not made in China. We're not made in the USA. You and I are God made this morning. We got his fingerprints on him. Let me tell you something. You say, oh, he's pretty, oh, he's just trying to get me excited. No, I'm not trying to get you excited. I'm hoping to get you to understand that you're his plan. See, sometimes we could think that someone else is going to do it. Well, maybe more interns from Vanguard will come and they'll do it. And Well, maybe they'll hire somebody. No, I'm telling you that God has already called his plan. He's already set it in motion. You and I, the person next to you, we're his plan. Someone say, I'm his plan. Come on, say it like you mean it. I'm his plan. I'm sure the disciples had those moments too where they had to check the tag again to make sure. But where's plan? Don't, don't believe the lies of the enemy that would want us discouraged and deceived and divided and delayed and stuck there in our seats when this is not a time to stand back. This is a time to step up. This is the time that God has called us to serve. You know what I'm learning? I'm learning that you got to know your worth. We, we were worth the blood. We were worth it to God. The Bible says he sent his only son to pay a price that we can never pay. Matthew Henry said this, God in his, in his new creation has designed and prepared us for good works. Created unto, unto good works, he said, with the design that we should be fruitful in them. With the design that we should be fruitful in them. Wherever God, by his grace, implants good principles... They are intended to be for good works, which God hath before ordained, that is, decreed and appointed. In other words, we're his plan. He's called us to work. He's called us to serve. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In other words, every single one of us has received something from God. Your gift may be different than my gift. My gift may be different than your gift. For a long time, I always wondered, God, what are my gifts? I don't know how to fix nothing, play nothing, sing nothing, do nothing. Come on, somebody. All I, ever, all I was ever good at was getting in trouble. I remember when I graduated the men's home. Come on, get up for the men's home. I don't know if you know about the men's home. That's one of the best things about Victory Outreach is our men's and women's home. Me and my wife were just talking about that on the way back from Mexico. Like, what a privilege. We just had a graduation and to see these Lives changing, it's, it's a miracle. And I remember when I graduated the men's home, I thought, I was sitting there in the house like, now what am I going to do? Should I go buy a harp? Just, what am I going to do now, right? I'll be a good little church boy. I was never any good at being good. But that's when that morning that I was thinking those thoughts, God gave me a promise in Proverbs, five, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He said, and I will direct your steps. I was 19 years old. 19 years old, fresh out of the men's home. At a turning point in my walk with God. This is over 20-something years ago. I remember sitting on that couch, wondering what was going to happen with my life. And God told me, gave me a personal promise. He said, trust me with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. And in everything you do, acknowledge me. Then I'll direct your steps. Imagine that. God Almighty can and will lead us if we let him. I felt like that was a contract. I was, where do I sign, Lord? You're telling me, he said, if you do your part, I'll do my part. Your part's to trust me. Don't lean on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me. If you do your part, I'll do my part. And God has been faithful for over 20-something years to me and my beautiful family. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We all have a part to play. Everybody has given, been given something to give to him. Rick Warren said this, God gave me a gift, not for me, but for you. And God gave you a gift, not for you, but for me. Our gifts are to better the body. Our gifts are to add something to the body of Christ. So guess what? That means that when we hold back our gifts, when we hold back our works, when we hold back our service, we're not just robbing ourselves, we're robbing the body. That means the church won't be as strong as it could be. That means that we won't reach as far as we could reach, and we won't be as loud as we could be without your part. Everybody matters. That means that if you're serving in the cafe, that cup of coffee matters. You stand at the door and smile at people when they walk in. Sister Marine, she's a blessing. Sister Marine right over there. I walked in kind of late, amen. I felt like Rodney Dangerfield. I walked in kind of late. I was, oh, man. And I, I came in. I said, oh, man, I'm a victory outreach preacher. I don't know these people going to, I don't want to scream too much. Hallelujah. I was brought up with the three S's of preaching. Screaming, sweating, and spitting. Hallelujah. Hey, come on, somebody. I was going, oh, we're going to do a Holy Ghost party at Luminate this morning. I was kind of nervous, though, I'll be honest with you. I'm used to preaching in a full suit on Sunday mornings. And I was kind of nervous. I was kind of late. I was kind of frazzled. And the sister Marine, she was right there at the door. She said, come here, sweetness. <laughs> and she gave me a Holy Ghost hug. She gave me a mama hug right there in the hallway. I said, how did you know I needed a Holy Ghost hug right now? Did you know that what she's doing at the door, that's the Lord's work. They say, no, Dr. Tommy's doing the Lord's work, and he's preaching every Sunday, and that's what the Lord works. No, the Lord's work looks like the usher at the door. The Lord's work looks like the children's ministry worker. The Lord's work looks like the media crew and the worship team and the coffee crew and the interns. Come on, somebody. God is called his church to serve. And when we don't serve, needs go unmet. Oh, I hope there's somebody here today that could take a little ownership and say, not on my watch, not in my church. I don't want anybody to leave without that Holy Ghost hug. I don't want anybody to leave without a prayer. Come on, somebody, without somebody reaching out. I remember when something clicked in me when I was under my pastor and I was at my church. And every time they said, is there anybody here for the first time? I would turn around like, It was hogging. Come on, somebody. I was like looking for new people. And then I would be like, you know, worshiping like this. Because if somebody tried to get up and walk out early, you know, that happens sometimes. Especially when someone's new. There's, it's the first time at church. And, uh, oh, man, I'll be why. And if I seen them walk out early, I'd get up and walk out too. Sometimes they were just going to the restroom and it was awkward. But <laughs> I did catch a few, amen, in the parking lot. But you know why? There was a sense of ownership. They said, man, I don't want needs to go unmet in the church house. 
I don't want anybody to come and not get touched and not get encouraged and, and not get reached out to. Is there anybody say amen to that? Our gifts are designed for the body. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. You and I have all been given gifts, and I want to tell you something important about your gifts. Number one is you have them, and we've just seen this in Scripture. Everybody's been given something. When it comes to gifts, there's three things that are important. They're in your notes. I want to encourage you to write these down. The first thing is when it comes to your gifts, you need to identify your gifts. We need to identify, Lord, what is my gift? What is my contribution? What is something that I could do that you've given me to bring into your house? You could pray and ask God to show you. That's something you could do. Say, Lord, I really want to seek you if I have to spend a week seeking you, if I have to do a fast and seek you, if I have to search the scriptures. Lord, I want to seek you, and I want you to show me and reveal to me what are my gifts. Something else you could do is you could, if you're, those that are very serious, I've learned this, that if you're very serious about growing, you're very serious about identifying your gifts and finding your power spot, is that you go to, the, go to the five people that know you best. Not the five people you've made the best impression on. Come on, somebody. We all know how to do that, right? Oh, they think of me. They think real high of me. I'm going to go ask them. No. Go to the ones that know you the best. Go to your wife. Go to your husband. Go to your brother. Go to your boss. Go to your coworker. Go to that one that really knows you. This is only if you're serious about developing your gifts. You ask them and you tell them like this. Listen, I am very determined to grow. I'm very determined to find my niche and to get in my lane and discover my gifts. So can you please tell me and tell them, the more honest you are, the better. Don't worry about hurting, hurting my feelings. I need you to be very honest. What do you see as my three top strengths and my three top weaknesses? You ask five people. What do you see as my three top strengths and my three top weaknesses? Now, if you see the same thing on everybody's list and you know that's a strength. And then that, and if you see the same weakness on everybody's list, well, well, you know you got a weakness right there, right? And here's what you do. You work on your weaknesses, but you focus on your strengths. I remember getting a book one time at the airport. It was a book on successful habits or successful people, but there was something in this book that stood out to me. It says, too often, too many of us, we focus on our weaknesses. We put all of our attention on where we're not good. And they said, perfect example. They said, when, when your child gets a, a report card and they bring it home, and you get it, you're like, okay, history, B, Math, A, K, English, uh, C, uh, uh, science, F. F? You got an F? Oh, no. You got an F in science? Guess what, honey? Go on Amazon, order a ton of science books. It's about to be science for breakfast, science for lunch, and science for dinner. We're going to have all kinds of science up in here. And all of a sudden, all our energy, all of our attention, we focus on the F. Yes, work on the F, but let's focus on our strength. They got an A in math. You got a future accountant right there in the building. But we got to flip the script. And we got to say, you know what? I need to identify where I'm strong. I need to identify the gift. I need to identify the strength. So important if we're going to serve effectively in the body of Christ. Identify your gift. Second, after you identify, you develop. You can't develop a gift that you haven't identified. And can I tell you one, one other thing in, in regards to identifying the gift? Another way to identify your gift is to identify what do you enjoy doing. What's a passion for you? You say, man, I really like doing this. I really lo lose track of time when I do this. I really don't feel this is work at all because I enjoy it. Well, many times what you enjoy doing is tied into what you're gifted to do. 
And what you're gifted to do is tied into what you're called to do. So when you identify what you enjoy doing, you can many times trace that back to what you're gifted at and, and what you're gifted at to what you're called to do. Come on, give the Lord a good hand of praise for that. When it comes to our gifts, we should identify, we should develop, start to use it, start to find places that you could, you could work at. Sometimes we feel like we got a gift and we already identified it, God showed it, we know it's there, but then we're embarrassed to start using it. Listen, I want to tell you, you don't have to be great to get started, but you got to get started to be great. Get started, start using it, start developing it, start swinging that sword. Huh? I, I, as a UTC director, I would get asked all the time, Pastor, I want to preach. Teach me how to preach. I want. And I said, man, preaching is like, like in the movies. You know, you see like sword fights. It's like, ching, 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 ching. They're up on the rocks and they're like from the back. And they're <laughs> but then when you really pick up a sword, those bad boys are heavy. You ever picked up a real sword? You're like in your head. You're like, I'm over there. Ching, 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 ching. And then you get the real sword. It's like. pulls you all the way over it takes time to develop it takes time to swing the sword you got to start swinging that gift you got to start using that gift you got to start stepping out and developing the muscles of the gift that God has given you because after that gift is identified and it's developed then comes the fun part you start to deploy your gift into the battlefield you start to deploy your gifts into the church house you start to utilize and function and there's a great feeling when you're doing what you were gifted to do give the Lord a hand of praise this morning some of you, I believe, that you're going to step into your gift at a new level. Life gets exciting when you're moving in your gift. There's nothing like the feeling of moving in your gift. Now, I, I want to bring you back to Acts chapter 6. The apostles, after recognizing that there was a need for a different structure, that they were moving in the power and God was bringing the increase, but they recognized that there was needs going unmet. So their plan was to appoint. They said, let us appoint. Choose seven men from amongst you and let us appoint. That word appointment means an assignment, a responsibility, or a position. Let us appoint somebody here. This is their place. This is their position. This is their role. This is their responsibility. They said, let us appoint people to this place. In other words, this is the Lord's spot for you. This is your assignment. Serving in the Lord's work is a position and a responsibility, and it means that we need to take ownership and take it as the Lord's work. Let us appoint. What type of people should we appoint? And they went off to mention a few things. Number one, people of good reputation. A good reputation with God and man. What builds a reputation, or many times in the house of the Lord, we say testimony. Did you know that you have a testimony? What do people think when your name comes up? Oh, this guy. I was in the, in the back with Pastor and some of, the, some of the friends, and one of my brothers brought up a, a name of somebody we both knew from some time ago. And I said, oh, man, that guy's a character. And I said, oops. But what come, when your name is brought up, what comes out? Because that's your testimony. When we think about serving in the house of the Lord and doing, the, doing God's work, we think about having a good testimony. What builds a testimony? Consistency. Character. Commitment. Consistency. Character. And commitment. That builds our reputation in the house of the Lord. Somebody that's focused and committed. I love this quote here. I don't do works or service to get saved. I do works and service because I'm saved. You know, sometimes we think, I don't have to work for it. No, no, we're not. We don't do these things to get right with God. We don't do service and works so that we could be right with God. We do service and works because we're right with God. Because of what he's done, it's a response from the heart. And this is another one that they pointed out. What kind of people... Should we be looking for to help us meet the needs? They said we need people that are full of the Holy Spirit. We need people that are full of the Holy Spirit. 
You know, every time I come here, Pastor Tommy so graciously invited me and my family to the uh, Easter uh, production. Is it risen or? I will follow Christ. That was beautiful. Beautiful. Animals. Come on. Jesus came out from the ceiling, I think. I was like. I was like. He had seats for us. Wow, it was really nice. But every time I come here, I get jealous of the building. I'm like. When, Lord? Right? And as, a nice, as nice as the building is. As beautiful as the music is and the screens and all the great things that, that this church has been blessed with. How many know none of that matters compared to the having the Holy Spirit? We could be outside for a night of worship and love them just the same. And feel them just the same. I want to leave you with that this morning, church. Is that we desire to be full of of the Holy Spirit. People that are full of the Holy Spirit, they have connection. There's no way to be full of the Holy Spirit without a connection. That connection is so desperate. You know, if your phone doesn't get connected to power, what happens? Ever been to the airport and seen people sitting on the floor just to be, right? I've seen people sitting on the floor and in corners and restrooms uh, just so they could get power. I don't want my phone to die. I wonder what would happen if the church would get as desperate as people are to have their phones powered up. If we would be that desperate to stay connected to the Holy Spirit and say somehow, some way, I don't ever want to lose my connection with God because he is my source of power. And without him, I can't function. People that are full of the Holy Spirit have connection. People that are full of the Holy Spirit have consecration. What does consecration mean? It means to be separated. As men and women of God, you know what happens when you start to get close to the Holy Spirit? He starts to whisper into your heart. I want you to let go of this. I want you to stop watching that. I want you to stop, stop hanging around with them. Serving God isn't about what we can't do. It's about what we can do. But because of who God is and he's in our heart and in our lives, you're going to want certain things less and less. And all of a sudden, the Lord, it's not that the pastor is going to convict you, leaders are going to, you're going to feel that conviction. I need to make a change here. And you know what? I'm different now. I need to stop that. I need to move away from this. I need less of that and more of this. What, what is that? That's the Lord consecrating and separating his people. People that are full of the Holy Spirit, they have connection. They have consecration. And thirdly and lastly, they have correction. They have correction. They allow the Lord to deal with them and to move them and to position them. He say, Lord, you are my Lord. And I'm giving you guidance in my life. Speak to me how you desire. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 6, after they separated these men, these seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, they set them before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith of the Bible says that the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. How many know that that's what God wants to do here in the house, illuminate? Come on, so God wants to, his word to spread, the disciples to grow. How many know we got a little bit of room right here? How many are praying for your family to get saved, your neighbors to get saved, your loved ones to get saved, the city of Covina to get shaken up for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ? That's what happens as a result of people taking their place. They recognize, hey, we need more people. We need people with the Holy Spirit and wisdom that can step into these appointed roles. And when they did that, what the church experienced was growth. We see it again in Ephesians 4.11. When it said he gave some to be apostles. This is a five-fold ministry. Some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints. 
for work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Watch this, verse 16. From the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part. What happens? It causes growth for the body and the building up of itself in love. When everybody's doing their part, what happens is their growth takes place. When everybody's doing what they were called to do, hands to the plow, using our gifts, the church just begins to grow. I believe this is a season where God is raising people up. I believe even today in the service, some of you maybe felt that tugging, that knocking in your heart. I believe that's the Holy Spirit moving and stirring in people's lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, he described his life as being poured out like a drink offering. Referencing the drink offerings that would take place at the yearly feast where they would pour out offerings at the altar of God. What a picture Paul paints of his life. He says, my life, my life is being poured out, man, like a drink offering. He said, I'm living on the poor. I live to give. And that's a servant's heart. To say, Lord, I want to do your work. I want to do your will. He also said in Philippians 121, for, to me is li- to, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I live to give. I'm living on the poor. A life that pours is a life that gives. A life that pours is a life that loves. A life that pours is a life that serves. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning. There's something that I started saying in our church when our church first started. First he'll do it to you, then he'll do it through you. First he'll do it to you, and then he'll do it through you. I believe there's both people here today. Those of you that have been serving, and God wants to encourage and empower you this morning. Those of you that God is calling to serve and say, it's time to cross over. It's time to, to put your hat, throw your, throw your name in the, in the hat. It's time for you to put your hands to the plow. It's time for you to get to developing the gifts that I've given you. And possibly there's some here this morning that you're the one saying, you know what, Pastor, I need him to do it to me. I'm here today. But I haven't surrendered my life. I haven't given, trusted him. I haven't put my faith in him. I haven't surrendered my life and my heart over to him. I would love to pray with anybody here this morning that says, Pastor, I'm here, but I've been living my life. I've been doing it my way. I'm not surrendered. I'm not living for Christ. I haven't given my whole heart to him. And I want to put my faith and trust in him this morning. If that's you, I want to pray with you. If that's you, lift your hand. I'm, I'm not going to call you out. Praise the Lord. God sees your hand. God sees your hand. God sees your hand. There's a lot of hands going up. Lift your hand. If that's you, you say, I need Jesus in my heart. I need to make that confession. Hallelujah. I want you to say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness. Please wash me in the blood. Forgive me. Of all my sins, I submit and surrender to your leadership. I receive you in my heart as my Lord and Savior. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that your word is like seed that lands on our hearts. Lord, I know that you're raising up leaders, you're raising up workers, you're raising up pillars to take their place in this house. And I pray that your word would, would, would land on good soil. Let, let it cause a stirring and a shaking. Let it speak loud and clear to our hearts and our lives. I pray that even throughout the week, Lord, your word would come back and bring to remembrance and confirmation, Lord. I thank you for this time. I plead the precious blood of Jesus upon your people this morning. Fill our hearts and seal your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a good hand of praise this morning.